Cool. All righty. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about Ballista, which is a distributed compute platform built with Rust and Apache Arrow. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick bit of background about me. Uh, basically, I've been in software forever, like 30 years now. And throughout my career, I've always worked with database technologies in one form or another, starting with some ancient things called DBase and Clipper in the 80s. Um, more recently, I've been working with uh, Apache Spark. And um, th this is kind of the, the start of why I started to build Ballista. Um, Spark's a really cool platform, but having worked in Java for 20 years, I'm kind of tired of some of the aspects of Java. And when Rust came out, um, it just seemed like a really interesting language. So I started learning that a few years ago. And as I was working with Spark, uh, sorry, working with Rust and working with Spark at the same time, you know, I just had to ask myself, you know, what would, what would you know, what would it look like if we just built Apache Spark in Rust instead of Java? And I had this hypothesis that um, even building a naive implementation in Rust would have like pretty good performance without the need to um, do like really complex things to optimize it, as Apache Spark has done. Uh, I also wanted to learn Rust, and this seems like a great opportunity to. Kind of leveled up my skills there. Um, so I've been working on this project for about three years now, and it's actually um, the project was too ambitious when I started. So along the way, there have been some smaller kind of deliverables, I guess. Um, so the projects that have come out of this, there's a SQL parser in Rust, which is pretty mature now. Um, there's Apache Arrow Rust implementation, which I'll be talking about in the presentation, and then there's Data Fusion, which is a query engine uh, that uses a library, so it's just in process. No, it's not distributed at all. And finally, Ballista is the thing that I've been trying to build all along, which is the distributed query engine. So, so I wanted to build this thing. So why, why did I choose Arrow? Um, so Arrow is, in my opinion, becoming the de facto memory format for columnar data. Uh, there's a, there are a bunch of projects that use Arrow already to some degree. I've listed some of them here. Um, and I thought it'd be really cool to build a new platform to be Arrow native from the start. Um, it'd be great for interoperability with other platforms that already have some Arrow support. And then why Rust? So my career has been mostly Java-based for a long time, some C++ prior. And I really, when Rust came out, I really saw it as a uh, like a good compromise between Java and C++. You have all the speed of C++, but with the safety of Java, but done different. Um, so no garbage collector um, has its own unique way of managing memory. And that's great because it means you no longer have GC pauses to worry about garbage collection pauses. And that's one of the one of the challenges you have using platforms like Apache Spark that are dealing with large amounts of data. Okay, so what, what is Apache Arrow? So um, if you go to the website, it describes itself as a cross-language development platform for in-memory analytics. So what does that really mean? So Arrow is really, so primarily there's a specification which is made up of three parts. There's the, what's just referred to as the format. This defines a memory format for column the data. It covers all the data types you would expect from primitives to complex types like list, map, and struct. And there's a lot of details in the memory format, but to kind of um, distill it down, it's basically about using contiguous buffers in memory to represent data. Um, so if you have a fixed width data type, like a 32-bit integer, then you just have an array of um, those entries. Um, if you have variable width data, then the, like strings, uh, the string data is also stored in a contiguous buffer, but then you have a separate array with offsets into that buffer, marking the start position of each row or each entry. And then you also, if, if you have a data type that's notable, there's a separate bitmap which specifies which entries are valid or not valid. Um, so having these bitmaps allows some efficient operations. Like if you're, um, you know, you can and or, or bitmaps together very efficiently. And really the one of the main points of Arrow is that it's designed for vectorized processing on modern hardware. Um, so, so typically that means the SIMD feature on CPU or running on GPU. Um, Arrow is also just great if initial ability point of view. So if you have systems that use Arrow, you no longer have these massive serialization overheads when you send data from one through the IPC part of the specification. So when you're exchanging Arrow data, you're typically just passing pointers between languages, uh, if it's in um, like on the same computer. 
And in addition to passing these pointers, you need to know what the data actually looks like. You need to know the shape of the data. So the IPC spec specifies a, a flat buffer based format for describing schemas as well. So there's a, there's a spec to serialize the data itself. So that's pretty compelling. And then more recently, there's a new part of the spec called flight. And this extends IPC to distributed systems. So it's a gRPC based protocol um, that builds on the IPC format. Um, so you can send uh, streams of arrow data and schema information between processes. So that's great for, for me as I was trying to build a distributed system. Okay, so apart from the specification, there are also libraries available in just about every language. Um, some of these implementations provide computational kernels, so you can perform computations on these arrow arrays. Uh, so C++, Java, and Rust have those, and any of the libraries that just wrap C++, such as Python or R. And then some of the implementations now have query engines in development, and that's really just the C++ and the Rust implementation. So here's a trivial code sample of building an arrow array. In this case, we're building an array of 32-bit ints. So we create a musical builder um, and we specify, you know, it's a fixed size. And then we can go ahead and append values or append null to that array and then call finish to give us a immutable arrow array. Uh, this is an example of using a compute kernel. So in this example, we have two arrays. So A is an array of in 32. So these are kind of real values we want to operate on. And then we're creating a Boolean array with some, um, just some Boolean values. And then we can call the filter kernel. So what this is doing is filtering the integer array based on the Boolean values provided. Uh, so the result is another in 32 array. And you can see here we're downcasting. Um, so array, there's a, you know, there's a trait for that. And we downcast to a specific type. And then we can access the values within the array. Uh, so building onto uh, having these arrays are great, but if we're trying to build something like a query engine, then we need a way to represent tabular data. So there's a record batch struct, uh, which represents a batch of columns. Um, so the columns obviously have just a vec with array references. Array ref is just a, like an arc dying array. And we also have the schema information, so we know how to interpret the columns within the batch. So based on the schema, we can find the type of a column and then we can downcast to a specific type. So that's kind of just a whirlwind tour of Arrow. Um, so this is the, uh, the building block for the memory format for Data Fusion. Uh, so Data Fusion is this in-memory query engine with SQL and data frame APIs. This should look fairly familiar if you're used to things like uh, Pandas or Apache Spark. Um, so currently, it supports reading CSV, Parquet, and JSON, uh, as well as in-memory data. And it's extensible, so if you want to provide your own formats, there's a mechanism to do that. Um, until pretty recently, Data Fusion has been limited to querying the local file system. Um, but there's a lot of uh, work going on right now to add support for HDFS and S3 with an API that can support other uh, like object stores or distributed file systems. So that's Pretty exciting because it will make data fusion much easier. I think it will open up to a wider audience. So data fusion leverages the Arrow Rust compute kernels to get some pretty great performance. And it uses the Tokyo runtime to process partitions in parallel. Um, so many operations can be, the data can be split into partitions, computations can run in parallel. Um, for some operations, like if you're performing an aggregate query, you can perform the aggregate in parallel across partitions and then take those fine, take the aggregate from each one and do another aggregate to kind of collapse them down at the end. It's um, just a pretty typical approach in distributed query engines. The architecture is very traditional. Um, so the whole project is very much inspired by Apache Spark. Um, so if you're familiar with Spark, this diagram will look familiar. Um, so the data frame API is effectively just a way of building a logical query plan and SQL is just a front end onto that process. Uh, once you have a logical plan, there's a query optimizer, um, which produces a, an optimized logical plan. So that's handling things like pushing predicates down through a join 
So you try to predict a, as early as possible to limit the amount of data that you're working with. From the logical plan, there's a physical planner which produces the actual plan that will be executed. Um, so for the various operators in the plan, like a filter or a join, there's basically a, a Rust implementation to actually perform that by iterating over these record batches that we talked about earlier. And one of the really cool things about data fusion is that it's very extensible. So at any point, uh, there are several points throughout where you can plug in your own code, whether it's a custom SQL dialect you need to support, or you have some custom operators or in the logical plan, um, optimization rules and so on. And this is one of the reasons the Influx data have adopted data fusion as the core uh, for their next generation of Influx DB. Um, so that's been really great for the project. Um, it's brought more contributors along and data fusion itself is now maturing pretty quickly. Um, this is just a list of some of the operators or operations that are supported. Um, so the kind of usual things you'd expect to be able to perform complex queries, including joins. Okay, so here's a code sample using the data frame API. Um, so in this example, we're reading a local parquet file, and then we're selecting a subset of columns from it, and then we're applying a, a, a predicate. So we're filtering where ID is greater than one. So this is a trivial example, uh, but just gonna show us how to build um, a logical query plan. And then uh, if you want to execute that query and just bring the results back into memory, you can call collect. And you see it has a weight on there. This is all asynchronous. Um, you can also uh, just write the results out to disk in Parquet, CSV, formats, and so on. And here's an example using the SQL API. Um, so we start with a, an execution context as with the previous example. And here, we're, um, instead of querying the Parquet file directly, we're registering the Parquet file as a table on the context. Um, so we're calling this table all types plain. And after that, we can now reference it within a SQL statement. And again, this is just a trivial example. Um, but calling the SQL method returns a data frame, um, which is exactly the same data frame you would have if you just built it up through the data frame API. And again, we're just calling collect to execute the query there. Um, so that covers Arrow and data fusion. Um, so finally, Ballista, which is the thing that I've been trying to build all along and is still, um, I'd say it's still pretty experimental and kind of early on. Um, so Ballista takes data fusion and makes it distributed. So this is the kind of grandiose architecture vision of where, where I saw this going. Um, so basically on, that starts on the right-hand side. So Ballista runs as a cluster, uh, it has uh, kind of first class support for Kubernetes. You can also just run it um, you can just run standalone processes or run it in uh, like Docker Compose if you're running on a single node. Uh, but they're really just two, two executables. There's a scheduler and an executor. And the scheduler implements uh, as a gRPC, but it's actually the flight protocol. So if you have a client that can talk flight, you can send a query plan to the scheduler. And the, the job of the scheduler is to optimize that query for distributed execution. So basically it breaks the query plan down into phases where each phase can uh, be executed in parallel across the cluster. So the scheduler sends um, subsets of the query plan to executors, which will execute those parts of the plan. And then the scheduler can execute the next stage of the query. So each query stage typically is fetching data from a previous query stage that's already been executed. Uh, and again, and this is very much inspired by Apache Spark, uh, in particular, the adaptive query execution uh, feature in Spark, which is new since the 3.0 release. Um, one of the advantages of this approach of kind of executing the query in pieces is that after each piece is executed, you have really good statistics. So you know like how many rows exist. Uh, so when you're performing like a join, you can dynamically optimize as you run. Um, so if you see a join, Whereas like one side of the join is much smaller than the other, you can choose to do um, uh, like a certain type of join where you load the left into memory. Um, so those optimizations can work out pretty well. Uh, on the left-hand side, obviously because the protocol is flight. Um, and one thing that we've been really careful about building this platform is that everything as much as possible is language independent. It isn't really tied to Rust. So that opens up the possibility of building connectors and drivers 
in any language that can produce a query plan and serialize it in gRPC format. Um, the reality today is like not much of this is implemented. So there is a, a Rust client that lets you um, execute distributed queries, and there are now Python bindings, uh, which I think is pretty neat. So from Python, you can now run distributed queries in Rust. Um, these benchmarks are a little bit old now, and this kind of shows where Ballista is at. I, I should explain the title first. I said relatively fair benchmarks here. These benchmarks are running against uh, an industry standard benchmark with uh, where you can choose the scale that you run at. So you generate data randomized at different scale factors. And so far, we've only been testing with 100 gigabyte data set, which isn't really big data. And eventually Spark is optimized for really big data. Um, so that's why this isn't totally fair. And as you can see here, the performance is kind of similar between Ballista and Spark on many of the queries. Um, query six and 12 in this benchmark, Ballista was around twice as fast, which is encouraging. Uh, but there's lots of work to do. So it's, it's kind of it's kind of got to a good point where Ballista is the, the concept's proven that Ballista is capable of running distributed queries with reasonable performance. Um, but now the work is to implement the all the kind of advanced optimizations that Spark has. Spark is incredibly mature when it comes to its optimizer. And there's also a lot of work happening to optimize the underlying kernels. So I expect these results to improve over time. Um, that's kind of the end of the presentation. Got through that pretty quickly, I think. Um, so this is just my shameless plug. So I wrote a book a while ago, self-published. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about the internals of query engines and how they work, uh, I wrote this book, which walks through building a query engine from scratch with SQL support. Um, but unfortunately, it's not in Rust because that's too complex for this kind of book. Um, so I chose Kotlin because it's very concise and readable and kind of easy to, to understand. Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks for listening. And here are some links. I'll share the slides, obviously. Um, so here are links to the various repos for uh, Apache Arrow and Data Fusion and Ballista. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll give you the, the Zoom applause, which always sounds funny. But uh, thank you. Try to hear some reactions as well. But... <laughs> So work. Cool. That looks really neat. Uh, a lot of cool pieces in that. Questions? I have a, a quick one for Andy. Um, you, you had mentioned Data Fusion supports uh, on uh, local file system uh, sources like CSVs and JSON. Uh, does that include uh, files that are larger than what can be fit into memory? And, and if so, how does that work? Sure. Uh, no, it's the easy oh, answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> um, so right now, data fusion, it doesn't have, well, actually, that, it, it depends is the answer. So it does stream, it streams data from the file in batches. So okay. if you're running a query that's maybe just like a select with a where clause, then yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if you're writing the results to disk, absolutely it can. If you're running, if you're performing a join right now, we don't have any support for spill to disk. So joins have to load the data. And I've got to correct myself again. When you're performing a join, one side of the join gets loaded into memory and the other side is streamed. So if one side can fit into memory, then yes, and otherwise no. So um, I think spill to disk is going to be something that the community will, be, will need to build at some point. There have been some discussions about it. Um, so Ballista actually has the advantage there where it can support larger than memory because the query is being broken down into stages as each stage executes, it's streaming data. Um, I mean, it's running partitions across multiple nodes for a start. And then on each node, data is streamed in and streamed out to like, this disk storage between stages. Um, so it actually helps a lot with, with managing that. 